If I thought about who I was, it was just a very like someone who's good at memorizing things, someone who's good at like knowing things, but there was no one tapping me on the shoulder and saying, Scott, you're, you're a great guy and I need to get to know you more. There was no one saying that for sure. Scott Mankey never thought he had a particularly compelling personality, but he did feel he stood out in at least one way. He had a natural ability to learn and remember interesting facts. So in 2009, when Scott was in college, he tried out for the trivia game show Jeopardy, and he made it. Scott was excited to put his trivia skills on display and to hopefully earn some cash. But he was surprised when viewers responded not just to his performance, but to who he was as a person. One of the first comments that I remember seeing was this person saying, I really like Scott's demeanor on the show. And I didn't expect that reaction. It seemed to be like they liked who I was and they thought I seemed like a good good hang or whatever. And so that one, that one really struck me. On today's show, sometimes we just get ourselves wrong. I'm Maya Shunker, and this is A Slight Change of Plans, a show about who we are and who we become in the face of a big change. I've been friends with Scott Mankey for just about a year. I met him through my husband, Jimmy. They play in some trivia leagues together. So I wasn't surprised when I learned that Scott's always been a big fan of the TV show Jeopardy. He started watching it when he was in high school right around the time a contestant named Ken Jennings was taking Jeopardy by storm, breaking records and winning every game, Scott became mesmerized by Ken's epic run. And by the time Scott got to college, he was obsessed with the show. He skipped class to watch it, taped episodes and rewatched them. He even used a ballpoint pen as a stand-in for the buzzer. And Scott often found himself thinking, huh, maybe this is the kind of thing I could win. The thing I liked about Jeopardy was that it's very black and white. There are right answers and there are wrong answers. It's something that you can improve at. It's something that you can get better at. There's very little gray area whether Budapest is the capital of Hungary. That's just right or wrong. And I think I'm the type of person that that w would appeal to. And uh, there's something comforting about that. There's something comforting about not having to leave anything up to someone's interpretation of something. You can just know the answer and prepare and, and you're done, right? And, and it was the same way for me growing up in school, right? Spelling tests, I was the best speller. You just have to know how to spell the word and then you're done versus uh, you know, writing an, an essay about Charles Dickens and then your teacher has a different viewpoint on some point that you're making. And I don't know, I don't know how to succeed on that. There's no guaranteed way to succeed at that. And that's uncomfortable for me. Ah, the good old days when things were true or false. You're already making me nostalgic, Scott. Um, but but so you're in college, right? And you are now exclusively devoting yourself to Jeopardy. You're not attending class. What is that experience like when you you become a super fan of Jeopardy. What I found when I was watching the show so consistently was that I was getting better. And I started noticing that I was getting clues that the contestants weren't getting. And, you know, I was, I was sweeping categories in my mind. So I, I could tell that I was all of a sudden like in the mix, you know, I was, <laughs> I was being competitive with those characters on the screen. And as I started getting getting better and better, I, I had the thought that I, I could probably be good enough to pass the test and be a contestant just based on how many questions I was getting right. So on the one hand, I, I, I felt like my, my knowledge base was there, but the, the flip side of that is 
being a contestant, being someone who comes into people's living rooms and being having somewhat of a of a personality, I didn't know if I was if I was there and I didn't know if I had that to to offer necessarily. And where do you think that where did that originate from? You said you you had a what was the phrase you used a somewhat personality? Yeah, I think in in college I was just kind of a shy person. Uh and and all my life I had been that way. Growing up, I don't think being a super interesting person and being the the life of the party was necessarily valued by my family or by my parents. My mom immigrated here. She's Chinese. She's born in Hong Kong and moved here from Singapore when she was 13. And I think she really valued hard work and achievement uh, academically and, you know, any of like the social stuff and, you know, who my friends were and what kind of clubs and activities I was doing. I think that was secondary or like forgotten entirely. <laughs> and so I, I don't think I had that much encouragement to, to try and work on that part of myself. Um, like, I, I don't think I, I don't, I don't think I hung out at anyone's house or did a sleepover maybe like once or twice throughout all of high school. And I, I don't think that was a very big concern for them. I think they were just cool with me hanging at home with them and, you know, getting an A in French, got to conjugate those verbs. Okay. Very important. <laughs> I didn't think that there was anything remarkable about me as a person that would, that would make me stand out in any way other than I know the powers of two up to the 20th power, uh, or, you know, I got a perfect math SAT score when I was 13. I, I, I was just, I, if I, if I thought about who I was, it was just a very, like someone who's good at memorizing things, someone who's good at like knowing things, but there was no one tapping me on the shoulder and saying, Scott, you're, you're a great guy and I need to get to know you more or, uh, you need to you need to be out in front of people and and telling them all about yourself. There was no one saying that for sure. So I I don't know why I don't know how other people are are comfortable doing that when there's a very real chance that no one wants to hear from them and all of a sudden everyone loses from that interaction. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it seems like your default assumption was that unless you were explicitly told otherwise, what you had to say wouldn't be interesting to people. Is that right? Yeah, I think that is right. I think I just didn't have a lot of self-confidence. I didn't feel comfortable putting myself out there with people I didn't know, with a large group of people that may have different interests than me. I didn't think that I had anything to offer them really. I was into my thing, but you know, why would anyone want to know my thoughts and feelings about subjects that I'm not necessarily an expert in or, you know, that I don't have all the right answers to. Um, and so I was just shy and, and had reservations about sharing anything with them. Yeah. And that's, that's particularly interesting because it's not like I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it's not like people were actively saying negative things about you. They weren't coming up to you and saying, Scott, your personality sucks. You shouldn't be in front of large swaths of people sharing who you are inside. The feedback you were getting was the absence of feedback, right? Yeah. Um, so there was really no confirmatory evidence in either direction, but it seems like you decided in your mind anyway that, no, I'm, I, I you know, I'm smart, but I'm not really that fun to be around. People don't really care what I have to say. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's totally right. So so maybe maybe I've gotten some feedback in the past that I'm a nice person, but 
it, it seemed a stretch to me to suggest that I would then go on a on a game show and say, "Hey, everybody, look at me! I'm great." Uh, that 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 didn't track to me. Hmm. So Scott, given given everything that you've just described, right, being relatively shy, um, not feeling that anyone will want to have the opportunity to get to know you in any deep way, why go on a game show? Yep. Yeah, it's a good question. So number one, if you win the tournament, this college tournament, you can win $100,000. That's the amount of money that goes to the winner. Wow. So there's there's a real incentive there. Number two, I felt like it would be good for me, uh, like for my resume somehow. Like I wasn't doing that great in school. I thought if I if I was representing my school on Jeopardy, that that would be kind of reclaiming like some kind of you know good points for for me in some some sense. Uh, so you muster up the courage to audition for Jeopardy, right? Yeah. So I finally decide it's time. So the first thing I did was you take an online test. And a few days after that, I got an email that says, hey, you're invited to come to Washington, D.C. for an audition in person where you'll get to play the game and you'll get to meet some of the crew at the show. So that's exciting. So go there a month later and get into the room and there's 50 other hopefuls who are from nearby colleges sitting in this conference room. And I feel intimidated because a lot of them have better stories than me from the outset. And I'm like, I got, I got nothing. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm a little discouraged in the moment because even amongst the, the Jeopardy faithful who you would imagine are a little less interesting than the than the than the average person. Uh, I feel like I'm not scoring well against them, so uh, that was kind of the backdrop for for that that audition. And then I feel like I did decently when I was actually buzzing and answering questions. Um, that was kind of my crutch. I can do pretty well just answering questions. You know, that's my bread and butter. That's what I've been practicing all these years. And then comes time for me to, to talk about myself. And sadly, one of the, one of the fun facts that I wrote about myself w- was simply repeating a line in my bio. It was just, my name is Scott. I'm a senior in college. Uh, so there was nothing remotely interesting about that. It was just repeating uh, <laughs> information that was contained on the other parts of the form. I love how the line of your bio you chose was literally your name and college. The fact that you're a college student. It's a yeah. college tournament. I mean, they probably could have deduced that. That's very that's very charming. Yeah. Like you yeah, weren't even yeah. willing to go to the, I used to play the violin and hated it. Or I don't know what other hobbies one might have had growing up. Right. Very interesting. Right. That was that was number one. That was number one fact. Um, and I remember how I knew something about the show that no one else in the room had known. And what it was was the producer asks, does anyone remember who won the college tournament the previous year? And I raised my hand and I said, of course, it was Joey from Mississippi State. And uh, I think that in my mind was the difference maker. You know, I was kind of unremarkable in the other aspects, but the fact that I was such a super fan and and knew, you know, the show backwards and forwards and, and what had happened was what allowed me to kind of differentiate myself. And yeah, that was it. It was it was pretty quick. Didn't feel that optimistic about my chances and uh you know, felt like I did okay on the trivia and subpar on the personality part as expected. And so then what is it like to get the call that you you had been chosen from all those hopefuls? Yeah, that was that was great. I remember ever since I auditioned, I would fantasize about seeing that number show up on my little flip phone. And, uh, and I would just imagine like what, what that feeling would be like when I, when I saw this call come through the way I felt at that moment was, was joy. 
I remember looking out into the into the distance, into the ocean, and thinking, as cheesy as it might sound, like, oh, my life's about to change. My life's about mm. to change. I remember thinking that. And in what way did you think that it would change? I felt like, like I, I, I had been watching Jeopardy for a while, so to me, being on Jeopardy was a big deal. Yeah. In my mind, I'm like, now I get to be part of this club, and you know, it's going to be a maybe anxiety riddling experience, but it's going to be, you know, a big experience nonetheless. And then, what is it like, you know, to be? To be on the stage, the lights go on. You're so once we get to the stage, you're you're getting to go through the motions of of actually being on Jeopardy. I remember buzzing in correctly on a few clues in this practice round, and pretty quickly, I get ushered off stage, and the producers are like, "Scott, you're good. Good job. Good job. You don't need any more practice. You're all set." And I felt happy about that. I felt like I fit the mold of a good contestant in the sense that I did what I was supposed to do. I kept the game moving. I was looking in the right direction and pressing the buzzer appropriately and answering in with a good tone of voice. So I felt like I checked all the boxes of just fulfilling the contestant duties if they existed on a checklist somewhere. I felt like I felt like I was ready to play. And so yeah, I felt I felt good. <laughs> We'll hear how Scott did on Jeopardy! after the break. We'll be back in a moment with a slight change of plans. We're back with Scott Mankey, who successfully made it on to the Jeopardy! College Championship in 2009. So let's hear about Scott's experience on the show starting with when he introduced himself to the 10 million plus viewers watching at home. Scott Menke is from Flemington, New Jersey, teaches chess to who? Uh, at Johns Hopkins, we're in the community of Baltimore. So we go out um, into the more underprivileged communities in Baltimore and uh, we bring out a table every week and set up some boards and we teach chess to the, the kids in the, in the neighborhood there. Are they fascinated by the game? Are they really interested, or is it just a way to pass the time? It's a little bit of both. They're, they're pretty interested. Unfortunately, they forget the rules every week, so we have oh. to reteach them. That takes up a lot of time. But at the end, we usually get a few good games going. How did you do? How did it go? Yeah, my first game went really well. I had a small lead going into double jeopardy, and then in that second round, I really pulled away and reached... $30,000 at some point, which is a pretty decisive victory. And I went into the final Jeopardy knowing that I had what's called a lock game, or I, I had no chance of losing if I wagered appropriately. And then the second day? And then the second day, it, it was more of a back and forth game. I did well enough that I had the lead going into final Jeopardy, and I got the question wrong. So my Jeopardy run kind of came to a crashing halt when it was revealed that the answer to the clue was deadline and not headline, as I had written. Uh, so, so one letter kind of brought the whole thing to an end. That's so unfortunate. You should have been, well, good thing you weren't on Wheel of Fortune because it turns out letters matter a lot there. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Okay. Um, so what did it feel like, Scott, when, when this whole experience was over? Uh, I would say... Yeah, it was, I, f I felt good about it. I, f I felt like I, I achieved, you know, higher than 50 percentile outcome of, of what could have happened. My parents got to see me win there, which was like important to me. And I did fine. So I was happy with it. So what is it like after the show actually airs? I remember back in the, back in those days, by the way, 2009, everything's, everything's done on Facebook. All right. Facebook is huge back then. And there's this Jeopardy message board where uh, people post about the episodes and, you know, some predictions for the upcoming tournament, that kind of thing. I remember people on the message board being like, ooh, you know, Scott from Johns Hopkins. I think, I think this guy could be, I think this guy could be the winner. You know, we'll see. So there's, there's just like, <laughs> there's, I, I, I tried to consume all of the uh, media surrounding my appearance 
you know, which consists of this one message board mostly <laughs> and, you know, see what, what people's reactions are going to be basically. So then the first episode airs and first there's like a flood of, you know, Facebook friend requests, people sending me notes and, and things like, oh, wow, you did, you did so well. Congratulations. And then I, I go to the message board because that's where like the, the true Jeopardy diehards are. And, you know, I, I don't care as much that my neighbor from back home said, good job, Scott, because they would say that regardless of how I did. Um, but I want to hear from the, yeah, the, the, real the, the Jeopardy OGs. Yeah. What do I have their respect? And so I go to my episode page and yeah, one of the first comments that I remember seeing was this person saying, I really like Scott's demeanor on the show. You know, I think they, they had some other points about my performance and how, how many questions I got right or how well I was doing. But that was the first line, I believe, of the, of, of the post. And it really stuck out to me because I didn't expect that reaction. I thought it would be, you know, about, oh, how did I miss this question? Or, you know, good job getting, getting this one right. But it seemed to be like they liked who I was and they thought I seemed like a good, good hang or whatever. And so that one, that one really struck me. Um, so in addition to that, what was funny was someone created a, a Scott Mankey on Jeopardy fan club. Low membership, definitely. But, uh, but those really mattered. Hey, better to have a few high quality ones, right? That's right. That's right. We're going for quality. Yeah. A <laughs> hundred true fans. All right. That's what we need. Okay. I was touched by the fact that someone went to the, the trouble of of making that. Um, yeah. So, so that was, that was heartening. I thought I would be passable and an acceptable person in terms of how I came off. But I, I just remember people saying that they'd want to be my friend or they'd want to, you know, they'd want to meet me just based off how the, the episode was. So, so you're starting to notice that people are responding to you right? Not, not your trivia prowess, but to you. They, they, they like you. They're expressing that they want to be friends with you, contrary to your working model of the world, which is that you had nothing interesting to say and no one would want to hear what you had to say. It sounds like people do. What was it like to have this realization about yourself for the first time? It was a, it was a substantial realization, and it made me wonder whether I needed to change how I interact with others and need to share more and need to put myself out there. If they enjoy me for who I am, then maybe I need to share more of that. And did did this realization lead you to reinterpret anything that had happened during your, your Jeopardy experience? Seeing people respond that way made me wonder whether that same thing came across when I was filming the show and whether I was getting a similar response there. And so I thought back and I do remember the different crew members on the show joking around with me during downtime and talking about other shows that they'd worked on and different celebrities and, and who was nice and who was not and <laughs> different, different gossip from you know behind the scenes of, of some of these shows. And I wondered if it was maybe them just wanting to hang out and, and me seeming like a, a good person to talk to. Um, made me reconsider that. Yeah. And, you know, I imagine, you know, anytime we have a profound realization, you know, we can, we can prescribe a future for ourselves in which we, you know, change the way we are, but it, it, it's perhaps hard to put that into practice, right? Because so much of it feels so foreign. Um, so, so do you have any notable memories or any specific memories of when you kind of took the car for a test drive, so to speak, the, the personality car? So yeah, I remember, I remember the moment. I remember a moment. The, the moment was in Las Vegas where I lived after graduating. I would like play poker sometimes. And when you're seated at a poker table, it's just like 10 strangers and you're, you know, in between hands or when you're not, when you don't have cards, there's a lot of table talk or banter that's, that's going on. And I remember engaging in that. And this was like shortly after the, 
you know, less than a year after the episode had, had aired and feeling comfortable in that situation. Um, I don't think any of the opinions I shared were like notable, but it was things like, you know, talking about the the sports game that was on TV or um, talking about like iPhones. I remember iPhones were like new back then and kind of just like talking about the technology generally. But But I just remember feeling much more comfortable in my skin talking with these strangers. And I, I think if I was at a poker table before Jeopardy, I would just you know, sunglasses, hoodie up, (laughs) just looking at the, looking at the cards and and caring about the game. You know, it's so interesting. You mentioned, you know, my, none of it was notable stuff. That's exactly the point. I mean, the fact that you felt that in order for something to be worth sharing before all this, it had to be notable is such a high bar as a human being to have to try and meet in conversation, right? And so I think I think it's precisely because the things weren't notable that it's a sign of, of of emotional and psychological progress, right? You were willing to share pretty banal views on the iPhone. That's fantastic. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can go too far where <laughs> you know, people are are tweeting about turkey sub for lunch, all right? You know, del- but given where you started. Yes, exactly. Given given where I started, I think I think it was progress, and I think that's a that's a great point. Um, and yeah, I, like that is the difference between me now and before. Where I, th- this is making me realize the things about myself, Maya. Maybe maybe this is the biggest difference. Where it's just in these very commonplace situations, um, you know, sitting next to someone on the plane, like just having small talk conversations about how you feel about very ordinary mundane things talking about the weather even though that's such like a that's such a a cliche like yeah it's it's getting warmer out and and i i like that because you know i like the longer days and you know it's it makes i can wear a a lighter jacket it's 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 better i feel more comfortable sharing those thoughts now than i did before and i think that is like freeing and and cool in a way yeah you know, I can imagine people saying in response, oh, but Scott, like, you shouldn't have needed other people to validate your personality, to validate that you're likable. And I mean, it's not entirely untrue, but at the same time, we are social creatures. What does it mean to be objectively charming? It doesn't mean anything. There's only such thing as subjective charm, subjective likability, right? Um, or at least that's my view of the world. And so... I think it is more than reasonable for us to at least seek some feedback from from others. That, that's not to say that other people's approval or validation should constitute the entirety of our self-confidence and resolve all of our self-esteem issues or cause self-esteem issues. But it's data. It seems relevant, right? I totally agree. Yeah, I think it is data. I think it offers a glimpse into how others may view you and and underappreciated aspects of yourself that may exist. And I would encourage people to seek opportunities to to find that, to, to find ways in which aspects of yourself that you don't necessarily think about or think highly of can be viewed in another light or can get kind of a second opinion on those things other than your, your own self-image. Yeah. And and I think another lesson from your story is, at a minimum, um, we shouldn't take absence of evidence as confirmation in either direction, right? We talked about you're having just a default understanding that unless I hear explicitly otherwise from other people, unless I hear otherwise, um, I'm just going to assume that I'm not worth hearing from. And it seems like, at a minimum, we should stay neutral on where we fall along different traits until... There's some thoughtful reflection happening in our own minds, or we have in- information from others. Otherwise, we're operating in a vacuum. And once we establish that default, as your story shows, it's very easy to to stay in that, um, to let inertia kind of propel you forward, and to make lots of life choices based on that understanding. Right when you when you could actually be thriving in other ways. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Totally. You know everything you're sharing with me right now is making me think about the fact that 
our our understanding of self is often far flimsier than we might think. Um, it's not like you had a brain transplant, Scott, right? Like you you had this underlying personality all along, this lovable personality. I mean, I, I, I can say that as your friend, I think you are a, a lovely, interesting, charming person to be around, but you had misjudged yourself, right? And, and I do think, I think we we mistakenly believe that because we have first person access to who we are and our own minds, that somehow our assessments of ourselves are accurate and comprehensive and reflect the latest shifts and transformative experiences that we have that affect us in turn. Um, but, but we fall prey to many of the same cognitive biases anyway, that lead us to misunderstand other people or create snapshots of who they are that aren't fully comprehensive. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just making me think about what else have you gotten wrong about yourself? Like, what else have I gotten wrong about myself? What am I, what am I currently getting wrong about myself today that I think I'm right about? It can go in either direction. Like maybe I have a totally inflated sense of self and I think I'm far more charming than I actually am. <laughs> Listeners, you can let me know offline. Um, but but more seriously, did your Jeopardy experience make you revisit other assumptions that you had about yourself? It did make me think that there are other parts of my personality that I have yet to explore or assumptions about myself that may be incorrect. I feel like I haven't gone far enough down that road to actively discover what those things are. Mm. But, but it's at least planted the thought. Is it's what planted you're saying? the thought and I accept that that huh. there may be things. Yeah. And so I, I do try and do new things in order to try and stumble across something that I may learn about myself. And I know that that advice may seem commonplace, but I thought I knew who I was at the core and what I like to do and what I was good at and what I wasn't good at. And I came out with an understanding that was that was very different. And I think that's that's changed the trajectory of how I lead my life now. So I, I think it's it's having a willingness to say yes to situations that may make you uncomfortable, especially in a forum where I'm getting feedback from others, because I think I kind of rely on that. I need I need others to tell me. Uh, if I'm getting good at things something. wrong, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do try and find opportunities to do that. I've yet to have a a sea change where I had some landmark discovery about myself, but I'm open to the idea, and I'm going to try and seek that out more. I mean, I I think that's fantastic, and I also think it's so reasonable to not have had a sea change. I mean, it's not like we're getting large swaths of things about ourselves wrong, um, you know, to the extent you're you're relatively honest with yourself. But I think the mere acknowledgement that we might be wrong about certain things is, is, is a critical mental change, one that I think is inspiring for a lot of people. Because while it, it's scary, perhaps, that we may have gotten some things wrong, it's also exciting, right? It's like, wow, what are these unexpected unanticipated parts of myself that I might tap into in these unexpected moments in life that I might uncover, that might make me realize that I was laboring under a misconception about for years and years and years, and I'm no longer going to be held back by that, and I'm no longer going to needlessly suffer. And what I find intriguing and interesting about your story is that you didn't go on to Jeopardy with this mission to unlock this entirely new facet of Scott Menke. You went on because you were like, I think I'm good at trivia and I think I can win a lot of money and it would be fun. And it is fascinating how the true change came after Jeopardy. You know, you had said earlier in our conversation, you know, I had this feeling like I looked off into the distance and I thought my life is never going to be the same or, you know, my life is going to change forever. Right. Yeah. I bet you never thought that this was going to be the way in which your life changed forever. Totally right. Totally right. It's... uh you know, the, the $10,000 that I won, the wild aspirations of, you know, professional implications of being on Jeopardy one time, 
those didn't really come to fruition, but I feel like the, the, the boost of confidence I have just being myself around others is the lasting change that has endured. Hey, thanks for listening. Join me next week when I talk with Dr. Edith Eager, a 94-year-old Holocaust survivor. Edith was 16 years old when she, her sister, and mom and dad were put on a train to the Auschwitz concentration camp. My mom looked at me and hugged me, and she said, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. And that's exactly what happened. A Slight Change of Plans is created, written, and executive produced by me, Maya Shunker. The Slight Change family includes Tyler Green, our senior producer, Emily Rostek, our producer and fact checker, Jen Guerra, our senior editor, Ben Tolliday, our sound engineer, and Mia LaBelle, our executive producer. Luis Guerra wrote our theme song, and Ginger Smith helped arrange the vocals. A Slight Change of Plans is a production of Pushkin Industries, so big thanks to everyone there, including Nicole Morano, Maggie Taylor, Eric Sandler, Heather Fain, and Carly Migliori. And of course, a very special thanks to Jimmy Lee. You can follow A Slight Change of Plans on Instagram at Dr. Maya Shunker. Jimmy was recently preparing for a trivia show, right? What was what was that like? Oh my gosh, I feel like it uh it tested our otherwise happy marriage, Scott. Um so I mean, he became obsessive about it, right? Like everything was about um everything was about learning facts. Uh every conversation between us uh felt clinical in, in a way. Um but then there was this one really tender moment where it was the night before our five-year wedding anniversary, and mm. Jimmy and I don't usually, you know, do the tradition stuff. So I, I didn't even, I wasn't really thinking about it. He, I, I mean, he never really remembers. But suddenly, he's laying there and he's like, "Oh my god, tomorrow's our five-year wedding anniversary." I was like, "Oh my okay. god, Jimmy, his heart is softening. Like as he gets older, he's getting a little more nostalgic. This is so great." And then I hear him muttering, "Paper, cotton, leather," and I realized. He's confirming that he knows all the anniversary gifts by year because it is actually a trivia challenge. (laughs) That's rough. That is rough.